Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. As Scott mentioned, um, today is uh, Palm Sunday, which marks the beginning of Holy Week. And for those of you that are unfamiliar, you might be a new Christian or maybe even new to church. Um, Holy Week is the time in which we remember the life, the suffering, the uh, crucifixion, death of Jesus Christ. And at the end of Holy Week, um, we, we celebrate um, Resurrection Sunday. So that will happen next Sunday. And on that day, we remember the glory of the resurrection. And so this week, we've, we've, uh, we have several things going on. We have a Thursday service, a Friday service. I sent out an email. Um, if you didn't receive that email, let me know afterwards, and we can get you on the email list, and I'll send it out to you. Um, and so please, uh, I, I encourage folks that this is a, a very important time within the life of the church, a time of, uh, that we're called upon by God to reflect on our faith and so this week, I pray that you might take the time to do that, that you might slow down, clear your schedules if you have to, and really take this time to focus in on, on your faith and the meaning behind um, this season that we have. So with that, let's look at Colossians. And I actually want to read, I know in your bulletin, I only have printed uh, verse 5 through 11, but I actually want to read um, from chapter 3, verse 1, down to verse number 17. And, and But we're only going to be focusing today on 5 through 11, and then next week, 12 through 17. So hear now the word of the Lord. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, purity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming, in these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So all flesh is as grass and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that will be taught unto you. Amen and amen. Well, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, indeed, this is your word. These are your people. Lord, they have gathered here today not to hear from me, but to hear from you. Because you have the words of eternal life. You have the words that their hearts and their minds and their souls need 
break free from the sin that enslaves them and to lay hold of the righteousness and holiness that you have prepared for them. And so now, Holy Spirit, come and meet with your people. I pray as we set aside this time to hear from your word that you will give what your people need the strength and help for their going. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. Well, up, up front, I want to say to you that um, you're going to have to forgive me a little bit. I have terrible allergies. And no matter how, many, uh, how much medication I take, it, it just never fails that my voice cracks. Um, so you're going to have to bear with me a little bit. Um, I want to ask you a question. You don't have to answer this audibly. I just want you to think about this for a moment. Why do you uh, observe Easter? Why, why do you observe Easter? Why does Easter matter? I want you to think about that for a moment. Um, when I was growing up, Easter was just a matter of tradition. I was telling someone this morning, um, if you lived in the Bahamas during the time that I grew up, um, you would buy two kits of fish. Uh, does, everybody, does anybody know what a kit of fish is? It's just, it's like this unique thing, but a kit of fish essentially is fish, it's like a, a, like a box or maybe like a sack of fish about this high. We'd get two of them, and we would spend all Saturday cleaning the fish. It was a disgusting affair. And, and as I was doing it, scaling the fish and cleaning it, and by the way, I got so good at it, I would scale all this fish, clean all this fish, wrap it all up, and as I was preparing the fish, I would ask myself the question, what does this have to do with Easter? Right? And so we would, we would clean the fish, and then we would eat hot cross buns, which essentially were sweet rolls that we would put icing on top in the form of a cross. And then we would dress up, you know, in, in our best clothes, and our mother would, would take us to church or send us to church. And, and Easter was all about that tradition. We, all we ate from, from, uh, from today, which would be Palm Sunday, until uh, you know, Easter Sunday was fish and hot cross buns for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you got kind of tired of it, and so you would stop eating. Uh, you know, you'd fast a meal or two, but it wasn't because... Um, you enjoyed fasting. You just got tired of eating all that fish. And we would do it different. We would fry it and stew it and boil it. And almost every way possible you could eat fish, that's how we prepared it. And I always ask the question, what does this have to do with Easter? Easter egg hunts and all that. Now look, I'm not against tradition. I think it was a good tradition because it instilled in my mind the value of the season. But the one thing that escaped me through doing all of that is this. Why was I doing it? You know, it's interesting to me. The children of Israel had the same problem. God told them to observe the Passover. And by the time Jesus Christ came on the scene, they had forgotten what the Passover was truly for. It was just a matter of tradition. But they forgot that the Passover was meant to point to a greater reality and that is they had been delivered by the mighty hand of God from the death angel. And that his grace and mercy was bestowed upon them. And they were a favored covenantal people. And for that reason, they ought to be committed to God and his word. But that had totally slipped past them. And one of the reasons, well, one of the things I wanted to do for the next two weeks is remind us of the significance and the importance of the resurrection. Because the last thing I want to do is for us to go through these things we normally do by way of tradition, and we miss what these things are actually pointed to. Now, I go back to the question, why do we all here today observe the resurrection? And the church has done it for the past 2,000 years, right? Why do we do that? The answer to that question is actually found 
in this passage. Notice what Paul says in chapter 3 and verse number 1 through 4. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. What is the point that Paul is making here? Follow Paul's logic because this is important. This is the reason why we observe Easter. Paul says that if Christ indeed has risen from the dead and you believe and trust in him, then you are raised with Christ. And as a result of being raised with Christ, you now have a new life in him. That your life now belongs to Christ. In essence, Paul is saying this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ points to the reality that of what we're truly saved from and what we are called to. What we are saved from and what we are called to. A.W. Tozer in his book, The Crucified Life, explains it this way. He says, the battle cry of the early church was, he is risen. Easter was not merely a holiday or a holy day. It was not a day at all. It was an accomplished fact uh, that lived with them all year long and became the reason for their daily conduct. Do you hear what A.W. Tozer says? The whole point of the resurrection is for us to look at it and see that we have been a transformed people and therefore our lives should, live, should be lived in such a way that evidences this transformation. He goes on to say he lives, this is what they said, he lives, they said, and we live. He was triumphant and in him we are triumphant. He is with us and he leads us to follow so what A.W. Toes is saying is this, the transformed life happens as a result of the resurrection. That is why we are here today, and that is why we celebrate the resurrection, to be reminded of the fact that we are transformed people. Why do you think Paul gives these two lists? Look at verse number 5 through 11. Paul details a list of vices. And then in, chapter, and then in verse 12 through 17, Paul um, gives a list of virtues. And what is the point of that? Paul does this often. You could look in several of his books, and he gives a list of vices and a list of virtues. Why do you think that's the case? It's because Paul wants us to see what life outside of Christ looks like and what life inside of Christ looks like. That's the point of these lists of vice and virtues, to remind us of what Christ has delivered us from but also what Christ has called us to. And what I want to do for, for just a brief uh, point in time is look at those things, uh, particularly from verse number 5 through 11. I want us to look at what Jesus Christ has delivered us from and at the same time what Christ has called us to. First of all, what Christ has delivered us from. Notice with me verse 5 through 11 and pay attention to verse number 7 in particular. After giving a list of vices, he says sexual immorality, um, passion, evil desires, covetousness. Paul says um, in verse number seven, in these you too once walked when you were living in them. Now what, what is Paul doing here? Why does Paul call to mind their sinful past? For this one reason, testimony. Testimony. You know, we've, we've seen people stand up today and give testimony. Do you know testimony is powerful? For these people, they experience sin. And they see what life outside of Christ looks like. And now they see what life inside Christ looks like. And I want to tell you today, only the Christian can have this perspective. Only the Christian understands what life in Christ, inside of Christ looks like and life outside of Christ looks like. Now, some of you inside your day say, well, Pastor Dan, I, I've, I've never really done all of these things to a, to a great extent. No, but you've seen the impact of these sins in your life and in your community. You have. You have. Even if this isn't your testimony, you've certainly seen the impact 
uh, that sin has on the life of God's people. And because of that, Paul says, because you see and understand that testimony, you're better able to address the sin in your life. Recently, um, somebody in our church uh, recommended a podcast, and it's called Compelled. Some of you might, have li- might, might be listening to it, and some of you don't. But in, in Compelled, this podcast, there are stories of Christians who lived lives in sin. I mean, like, grave sin. In fact, the last one that I, that I listened to, I was like, man, is this, should this be for, like, public consumption? I mean, it was awful. But it was, the, it was the testimony of Pastor Garrett Kell. And uh, Pastor Garrett Kell talks about his life um, outside of Christ. And, and if, you, if you listen to the testimony of his life, all the sins that he committed pa- are patterned after the sins that Paul gives here in verses 5 through uh, verse number 11. He committed sexual immorality, impurity, um, covetousness, idolatry. He, he was filled with anger and wrath and malice and slanger, slander and obscene talk. He lied consistently. I mean, his life was just patterned after this. And after he gave his testimony, here's something that he said that caught my attention. He said, looking back, I see now how I hurt so many people with my behavior and my lifestyle. Now pause for a moment. You might be asking the question, wait a minute, before he became a Christian, didn't he realize what he did? And the point there is absolutely he did. In fact, um, he was recalling several instances. One instance is that he got a young lady pregnant, and the young lady said, hey, um, I think we should get married. And he said, I don't want to marry you. And so he paid for the young lady to get an abortion. And right after that, he dumped the young lady. Next, there was the uh, these story of him doing drugs and him getting people who were with him to do drugs. And he saw the impact that drugs had on him, uh, on them, and how they destroyed their lives. And next, he tells of another story of uh, how he consistently lied to his parents about his lifestyle. And he goes on and on and on. And he says, even when I was doing those things, I knew those things were wrong. As an unbeliever, he knew those things were wrong. But he said he didn't have the power to stop doing those things. Why didn't he have the power to stop doing those things? This passage tells us why. First of all, the reason why, even as an unbeliever, even though he saw the destructive power of those things, he didn't understand the significance of his sin, and therefore, he didn't have the ability to get out of his sin. What changed for him? First of all, notice that his conversion to Christianity made the difference. Look at verse number 9 and 10. Paul says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self and its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. That's the language of conversion. Paul says that when you are converted to Christ, you get the knowledge that is after the image of its creator, meaning simply this. You have the knowledge now of the significance of your sin and what it does to others. That's so important. Remember, the Pharisees. The Pharisees were good people. I I had a professor in college said he would want a Pharisee as a neighbor. I said, what are you talking about? He said, because they always kept the rules. A Pharisee would always mow their lawn. A Pharisee would never park on the side of the road to obscure traffic. Um, A a Pharisee would always obey all the laws, right? That's what Pharisees did. That's what Pharisees did. He said, of course I would want a Pharisee as a neighbor because they were good people. They always followed the rules. They always paid their bills on time. They always did what they're supposed to. But what was the problem with the Pharisees? They didn't have the knowledge uh, that uh, they weren't renewed with the no- in the knowledge after the image of their creator. That's the problem with the Pharisees, and that's the problem with the unconverted. Of course they could see the depths of sins and the destructiveness of sin. Of course they can do all the right things. 
But the difference between us who are converted is now we are being renewed in the knowledge after the image of our creator, meaning we understand the impact of sin. And that makes all the difference. Something else um, that, that we as believers understand is we understand the judgment of God. Notice in verse number six, Paul says, as a result of these sins, on account of these things, he says, the wrath of God is coming. Now, again, this, this is talking about future wrath, that unless you repent and turn to Christ, the wrath of God will come on you. But there is a sense in which the wrath of God is on unbelievers now. You might say, Pastor Dan, how is that the case? Because an unbeliever cannot see the destructiveness of their sin. One of the things that Pastor Krell talked about over and over again in his testimony is this, that while he was doing all of those sinful things, he didn't fully understand how his behavior impacted all the people around him. That every time he did drugs, every time he slept with a young lady, every time he lied to his parents, he didn't understand the cost of that. He didn't understand how that behavior incurred the judgment of God, and he was blind to that, that sinful behavior. One of the worst things in the world for a human being is when they are blind to their own sin because it leads to irreparable harm. I remember as a kid, um, in my neighborhood, there was a crack house. Um, it was about two corners down from me. And, and here's the interesting thing. It, it didn't start off as a crack house. You know, when they were building the house, it wasn't like the architect said, you know what, uh, you know, I'm drawing this up, and, and on top he wrote crack house. And then they, they went to the bank and they said, hey, uh, we want to borrow $150,000. The bank said, what is it for? Oh, it's for a crack house. State of the art crack house, by the way. Now, I don't mean to make light of that, but, but here's what I want to point out that's so important. That house didn't start as a crack house. In fact, I remember the lady that lived in that house. The lady that lived in that house was a godly lady who loved the Lord. But her, she had a son who was a drug addict, and when she died, her, her son took over that house. And in the space of a year and a half, it was, I mean, it was just so surprising to me, in the space of a year and a half, that house from, went from being a beautiful residential home to a crack house. But, but it was gradual. He stopped mowing the lawn. Uh, when the windows uh, got busted, he didn't at that time replace those. When, when a hurricane came and damaged the roof, he didn't change the, the roof. The, the, the house began to peel and crumble, and it became a hellscape. And it, as I look back on that time, I wondered, why, at any point, he could have looked around and seen that, that what was happening to his house, what was happening to his life, and he couldn't. Eventually, the house was destroyed. Eventually, he died, and, and they had to tear down the whole structure and build, rebuild a completely new, a different home. And during that whole year and a half, not once did this young man stop and think, wow, um, I, need, I need to change my life. At no point he did that. Why, why is that? Because he was not converted. And he did not understand that the judgment of God was upon him. And because of that, ultimately, he was restored. One of the things about the converted life is that you and I can see judgment before it comes. And we can flee, certainly, from it. The last thing I want to point out from his life is that he was made fully aware of the consequences of sin. And that's one of the things that this passage sees us. That's why Paul gives these two lists. Paul is saying, look, look at your past life. Even if you haven't committed uh, some of these sins, you can look and you know people who have committed these sins and completely shipwrecked their life because we're aware of the consequences of it. I remember David in Psalm 51 makes this fascinating state, statement. He says, Lord, my sin is ever before me. Why do you think David says my sin is ever before me? Why does David want his sin ever before him? Because when your sin is ever before you, 
it changes the way you live your life. When your sin is ever before you, it helps you to see the goodness of God in providing Christ. When your sin is ever before you, it helps you to see how you truly need to repent and walk in humility. When your sin is ever before you, you're earnestly able to fight sin. When your sin is ever before you, more than anything else, you appreciate grace. You appreciate grace. That's the power of what's happening here. And Paul says, for you and I that have been redeemed by Christ, we have the ability to see these sins, to see the destructiveness of these sins, and walk away from them. Because we know ultimately what will happen. Now, point number two. Notice that being raised with Christ gives us the power to overcome sin. Notice what Paul says here. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Now, that phrase, what is earthly within you, is talking about the sin that seeks to destroy us. Paul says, put that to death. Now, uh, I was around a table last night, and I was going through this passage with my family, and I asked, um, hey, what does it mean to put something to death? Now, here's, here's uh, something I want to tell you. You never ask that to, a, uh, to a four kids from age 12 to 5. Because, because the answers that you get will frighten you, okay? <laughs> the answers that you get will absolutely frighten you. After, after I let them ask a few questions, I was like, man, these kids are dangerous, you know? I didn't know I was raising killers, okay? I didn't get the, I didn't get the answers that I want, but finally somebody spoke up and somebody said, oh, you, know, you deprive it of air, right? You deprive it of air. How, how do you kill sin? Because well, Paul says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly. How do you do it? You deprive it of life. What gives it life? Now, you might be asking yourself the question, well, Pastor Dennis, how, what, what gives sin life? What is it that gives sin life? There are, there are four things that give sin life. And don't, don't ever forget these, because this is true universally. The first thing that gives sin life is secrecy. Secrecy. Secrecy gives sin life. You know, when I was growing up, I used to hear people say all the time, the best disinfectant is sun. When I was growing up, um, we didn't have washing machines, and so my mother would wash all of her clothes by ha- all of our clothes by hand, and they would hang it. She would hang it up on a clothesline. And you know what? I still miss my clothes being dried by the sun because it's so much better. It smells better. It's disinfectant. You know, all these newfangled uh, ways of doing things, you know, blah, right? Wash your clothes by hand and put it up in the sunlight. It's the best thing for it, right? Um, but I still praise God for a wash and a dryer. Now, here's the point, here's the point I want to make. Secrecy gives sin life. It does. You want to deal with the sin in your life? Name it and confess it. It robs it of its life. The moment you go before the Lord and say, Lord, I struggle with anger. I struggle with wrath. I struggle with sexual immorality. Lord, I'm given over to obscene talk. The moment you confess your sin, you cut off its ability to have life. When you confess it, and it's no longer a secret. The second thing that gives sin life is pride or selfishness. You notice all these sins are inherently selfish? All of these sins are inherently selfish. Let me pick one, lying. You know, lying is a uniquely selfish act. Because why are you lying? I I tell you why we often lie. We often lie to avoid consequences. We often lie because we don't want people to think badly of us. Sometimes we lie to to boost our own standing or to make others think more highly of us than they're supposed to think of us. That's why we tell lies, right? Lies are inherently selfish because lies help, uh, lies kind of give us the power to augment reality. And one of the reasons why lying particularly, lying particularly is so devastating in the life of the Christian Because what is the gospel if not truth? And if we're supposed to be a people of truth, lying has no place in the life 
of a Christian. And so pride, like pride, selfishness, sin is inherently selfish. And so how do you deprive sin of that power? Serve others. How do you serve others? Well, Paul, Paul tells us, look at the antithesis of, of all of these sins. How do you avoid sexual immorality, the sin and selfishness of pride and se- sexual immorality? Enter into covenant with someone in marriage. Paul says that's the way to do it. Because then you have to give them more than your body. You have to give them your time. You have to give them your love. You have to give them your money. You have to give them all those other things, right? How can you stop being selfish? Paul says tell the truth to one another. Start there. That's a selfless act. Yes, it might mean that your reputation takes a hit. Yes, it might mean that people don't think as highly of you. But you know what Paul says? That's what the gospel calls you to do. Paul says if you want to cut off the pride that comes with sin, then stop coveting. That's how you deprive sin of its power. Notice the third thing. Um, don't, Don't allow sin to rent space in your mind to your thoughts. Stop obsessing over certain things. You know, so many of us, sin gets into our mind and we just think about it and think about it and think about it and think about it. And we don't see how, because we can continue to think about it, we give it life. Paul says, cut that off. In fact, that's what he says in uh, verse number one. If you've been raised with Christ, think about the things that are above. That's one way we cut off the lifeline of sin. It's by not thinking about it and thinking about other things, higher things, more glorious things. That's how we cut off the life of sin. Here's the fourth one, desire. You know the law of desire? The law of desire actually is found in James chapter 1, verse 14. Whatever you desire, you will do. Whatever you desire, you will do. That's the law of desire. If you desire sexual immorality, if you desire lying, if you desire malice and slander and obscene talk, if you desire those things, you will do. And so what Paul is saying here, Paul is saying, desire something else. Desire the glory of Christ. Now you might be sitting there and say, Pastor Dennis, I've tried. I've tried. I've tried to curb my desires. And I'm having no success in it. Right? Right? Now, let me say this. As a Christian, as a Christian, the word of God tells us that we, through the power of the Holy Spirit, if we could desire to do something, we could desire not to do something. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, right? What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6? I believe it's chapter 6. It might be chapter 5. But Paul says this. All things are lawful unto me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful um, unto me, but I will not be um, caught underneath the power of that thing. What is Paul saying there? Paul saying is this. If you're free to do something, then you're free not to do it. You're free not to do it. That's what we get in Christ. If you're free to lie, then you're free not to lie. Now, if you're in here today and you say, Pastor Dennis, I I don't feel free in this particular thing, then you're enslaved. And you need to plead for the power of the Holy Spirit to break you of that sin. But as a Christian, one of the glorious realities of our salvation is that we've been given the power of the Holy Spirit, meaning this, if you have the power to do something, you have the power to stop doing it. Because you've been set free by the blood of the Lamb. Now, what's the big takeaway? The big takeaway is this, and I want to remind each and every one of you of this. When we look at the sins in 5 through 11, some of us are, feel the burden of those sins because we've committed them. All of us have in word, thought, or deed. And I want you to know this glorious reality. You ready for it? Jesus Christ does not deal with us in accordance with with our sins that's psalm 103 he's he's merciful and he's gracious how do we know that pastor well look at his triumphant entry and psalm uh, in on palm sunday 
You know, when Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the same people that were worshiping him and praising him and, and shouting his name, those people three days later or so said, crucify him. And what's interesting to me is Jesus didn't stop them and say, stop, stop praising me. You all are hypocrites. All of you are hypocrites because I know as soon as you have the ability, you will turn on me and you will choose Barabbas over me. Jesus never said that. Why? Because he never deals with us in accordance with our sin. The glory of the gospel is that even though Christ knows our sin and he knows how sinful we are, both in word, th in word, thought, and deed, he still loves us. And he still provides salvation for us. And he still says, if you confess your sin, I will be faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That's the beauty of Holy Week. We are reminded of the grace of God. Yes, we're reminded of our sin. But even more important than that, you are reminded of the grace and power of God to transform us. All of these sins that are mentioned in 5 through 11, lying and, and, and sexual immorality and slander, all of those sins were imputed to Jesus Christ. For what purpose? So that he can take those sins and give us his righteousness. He gives you his righteousness. So that you don't have to walk in these sins anymore. You now have the power to walk in newness of life. And that's what we're going to talk about next week, verse 12 through 17. What does the redeemed community look like? Well, it looks like that. It looks like that. Father, we thank you so much of the power of the cross. And we are reminded of that power based on this passage. Lord, I'm so thankful for the candor of your word. Paul doesn't mince words. He doesn't use um, euphemisms. He's very clear on what we've been saved from and what we've been called to. Help the knowledge of our faith and the knowledge of what Christ has done for us to live as the redeemed humanity. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.